uh, in 2014 to regulate electronic identification and the number of trust services. Um, this was interesting for us because it is a, um, actually, as far as I'm aware, of, the only legislation that we have in Europe that explicitly requires the use of trust lists. So all of the other contexts that would, I've talked about, um, those are cases where trusted information needs to be published, needs to be made available, but there's no discussion of what kind of technology you need to use for uh, publication of trusted information. <coughs> Um, EIDIS changes that. It's very explicit. Um, so this is a regulation that all member states have to respect. And it requires member states' uh, supervisory authorities to publish information about the trust service providers who are active in their territory, at least qualified ones, the ones who meet specific quality requirements, in a specific format and specific template using a specific profile. So this is actually, it's not technology neutral. It's very specific. This is how it needs to be done. That's great. If you do that, if you're a company like that, um, you can get on, but you are required to be on the trusted list of your country. Um, if you do that, you're allowed to use this nice badge, which I don't know if it gets a huge amount of take up in the European Union, but there is a sort of a quality logo. Um, more importantly, if you are on the national list, uh, there is a compiled list at the European level that references the currently 28 national lists in all of the member states, um, meaning that if I receive a signed document from any other member state, uh, I can automatically validate that this is indeed from a trusted um, service provider and that I can rely on the legal value of the, of, uh, the signature and also the information contained in the certificate. Um, this is not just the theory, this actually also happens in practice. Um, the biggest probably application of that in practice, uh, we have a lot of them, but the biggest application field of that is the integration of this in Adobe software. As you probably know, Adobe has its own um, trust list, its own specification of um, signature companies um, that they consider to be trustworthy. If your signature validates correctly, you receive the green check mark at the top of the screen when you receive a signed PDF. If you use a signature that is not from a company on the Adobe Trust list, um, then uh, you don't receive the green check mark, you receive a comment along the lines of parts of the signature could not be validated, something like that. Since the EIDAS regulation was adopted, Adobe actually also has implemented support for the European Trust list in uh, Adobe PDF Reader. So now whenever I receive a signed PDF document with a signature that complies with the EIDAS regulation, it actually says um, signature validated using EUTL, the EU trust list. It was a very proud moment for many people. <laughs> yes, thank you. Just a quick question. Sorry, question but does the trust list, does that include only companies that fall strictly within the definition of trust services, or is it also EID providers? No, oh, indeed. Um, it's a very good point. So uh, I you know, have some backup slides that talk a little bit more about legal compliance and legal framework, but in a nutshell, the IDIS regulation has two different components, uh, one about electronic identification and one about trust services. The electronic identification component is actually only interested in making sure that um, electronic identification means which are um, used by the member states are recognized by other member states. So um, there's a framework there that allows you to do a mapping of the reliability, the trustworthiness of the EIDs. But if you're a private sector company and you have your own EID solutions, for instance, as a bank, uh, there's no need at all for you to align with EIDIS. You also cannot, even if you would want to, you cannot um, become a recognized electronic identification means under EIDIS as long as there isn't a government that wants to use your services. Um, very practically, suppose that you're a continue the example of Belgian Bank, and I have my own EID tokens that I use. Um, I would like to be uh, part of the EIDAS regulation. Not going to happen unless you get the support of the Belgian government. One of the requirements of being a recognized EID under EIDAS is that the member state has to use your electronic identification means for at least one public service application. So this is to avoid that member states, because the, the gatekeepers to this system are the member states. The member states have to send notifications uh, to the other, to each other, to other member states, saying this is our national EID. You guys need to recognize this. So member states are the gatekeepers, and member states cannot send that notification unless they're using the system themselves. This is to avoid a situation where member states send a notification for an electronic identification tool that they don't really trust themselves, but they would still somehow like other countries uh, to recognize. Unlikely situation, but still good to have that sort of gateway kept. In. But now uh, the EU or the e -com the Commission, whoever it is, they maintain a list of everybody who has every country who has notified, right? They do. Yes. Is that considered a trust list, or is that a different animal for this? this 
I would say functionally it is a trust list, but it's not kept in the same technical formats as the trust service providers. So the second component was the trust service providers, um, electronic signatures, electronic right. seals, yeah. stamps, delivery services. I'm happy to talk more about that later on. Those have to be published um, using a specific standardized format. For the EIE ones, there at least is at this point no plans yet to do that. There might be at some point, because the problem you're trying to solve, to be honest, is exactly the same. Would make sense to use the same kind of solutions. From our perspective, we might say, hey, you know what, we have uh, our lightest project, maybe you want to try doing this with DNS. But there's, under EIDIS, there is no requirement to use that, the trust list standards, trust, uh, trust list formats for electronic identification, whereas use of DNS is not something that's recognized under EIDIS for trust services. So there is that distinction between EID, where the Commission and member states can organize themselves pretty much however they want and for trust services which are very um, tightly regulated. Um, it's also, to be clear, um, the EIDIS regulation entered into force since July 2016. Member states were able to notify uh, national identities as of, I think, September 2016-ish. Germany is the first country that sent a notification for its national electronic identification means, I believe, in February. I don't know if there have been others, but at any rate, this is the first uh, national identification system that has been formally notified uh, to the European Commission. So that's nice. We have um, EIDIS regulation. We have that framework for trust uh, services and a requirement to publish trust lists. It's nice because there are very specific standards for the information that needs to be published on there. It's semantically perfectly defined, same across all of the member states. The quality requirements are the same. The quality expectations are high because all of the companies who are on that trust list have to go a biannual audit, an external audit, which they have to show the results to a national regulator. So this is one of those rare contexts where you actually work it with very tightly defined information with very homogeneous quality levels and very, very clear rules of equivalence. Qualified trust service provider in one country is exactly, legally at least, exactly equivalent to a qualified trust service provider in another country. It doesn't matter as long as you're in a member state, you're in the in group, so to speak. So this was for us a very interesting use case because at least there we don't have to worry about the semantics or the trustworthiness of the information. It is clear where it comes from, it is clear what the content is, and it is equivalent across all of the use cases. So that's what we want to do right now. We want to show with uh, the Lightest Project how you can use DNS to publish that information from trust lists, which is already publicly accessible right now, how you can publish that through uh, DNS as well. So it essentially require, um, rather than having um, XML lists being bundled at the European level, getting pointers to um, the publication of um, trusted information in the DNS system of supervisory authorities themselves. So that's what we want to do right now. Um, we just put the globe here at the end to point out that we know that this is not the only thing that you can do. In terms of ambition, this is a relatively modest one. We discussed the diploma recognition thing. That is a lot more significant, obviously, than the work that we are doing, a lot more complicated than the work that we, were, we are doing. But we want to start within this tightly defined context, um, simply because it is so tightly defined and we can avoid some of the challenges around that. This is true both for um, the Correos pilot and the couple of pilots. They use trust services that are on the um, EIDAS trust list, so we can build on that. We'll have to expand a little bit because there's a need for additional uh, components to be integrated. But this is good for us as a demonstrator to show that this um, can be done. And after that, we can see um, how we can expand it to other use cases. Can we take the next slide? So yeah, it does get complicated when you look at the legal and policy challenges um, in the uh, lightest that you need to resolve. Basically, what we're trying to do is create this mapping between the legislative and legal requirements that we need um, to face and the uh, assurances, the guarantees that you get from using the domain, the domain name system as such. So for legislative requirements, it depends very much on each individual use case. I've already talked a lot about the EIDIS regulation, electronic identification and trust services, which is very specific on which kind of technologies you need to use, which kind of information that needs to be published. Beyond that, obviously, we need to take into account um, the restrictions from the general data protection regulation that prohibit us, or at least would make it extremely hard for us to publish personal data, uh, personally identifiable information within the DNS system. So that's where we're trying to, our ambition is to cut a very hard line and saying there, that's not something that's going to happen within uh, the scope of the Lightest project. We're not going to be publishing 
personal data within the DNS system. Not because it's unlawful per se, but because it's very hard to justify, and also because um, the specific use cases that we have at least don't require the publication of personal uh, data within uh, the DNS system. Beyond that, um, you know, there are other, going to be other regulations depending on the use cases that you look at. I mentioned here the BRIS Directive, which is um, the Business Register Information System Directive. This is a directive at the European level that tells member states what should be involved in business registers. Who should manage it, what kind of information should be in there, how often it should be updated, and under which conditions they exchange it. This is an interesting one because it's one of those contexts where the information that can be exchanged and the trustworthiness of that is relatively well defined. It, however, it doesn't go into technical details. Contrary to the EIDAS, it doesn't have explicit requirements on how the information has to be maintained at the national level. Um, it, largely, this is a political issue. It depends very much on member states, how much appetite they have for allowing the European Union to impinge on their national sovereignty. In the case of you know, the EIDAS regulation, member states were convinced that there was enough added value to create a regulation that applies directly in the member states. For the business registers, you have a more high-level directive, and you have a, more opportunities for member states to implement national uh, changes. So, so why would I have to publish personal data? If we can't come up with business cases where it would be necessary. Mm -hmm. However, um, I'll, I'll get to it in a moment, but basically we want to make these pilots work, but we also want to have an explanation, and I think in the longer term that's important, we want to have an explanation in our reports on how you could use this kind of solution, how DNS should, how DNS infrastructure and lights. Assuming that you have two trusted parties, or two parties that trust each other, and one of them asks, did this person graduate from this college, yes or no? So I do an attribute match. I'm not saying what year, I'm just responding yes or no to the request. I'm not sharing any data, I'm just verifying the claim. So in that case, uh, Again, that's, you're not publishing anything, you're not sharing any data, per se. As long as there is trust between these two parties, the one requesting uh, confirmation of the claim or not, and verifying it yes or no, then you achieved your objective. Absolutely, that would be a possibility to do that. Right. The, the only thing that we are very reluctant about is giving the signal to people that when you need to publish or validate trustworthy information, just throw it in the DNS system, and then that way everybody who wants it can get to it. It's actually true that that way everybody who wants it can get to it. It's just that's not the situation that we want in the end. At least not in all cases. For some cases, it might be positive. Um, I think probably for all of us, we publish our uh, personal data on the internet already. At least from my side, I have my name and my phone number and my email address on the internet, which is how clients find me, and I'm perfectly happy with that does not mean that, as a general rule, I'm okay with all of my personal information being published on the internet. So, one of the things that we want to provide within uh, LIFIS is not just the functional pilots, but also an explanation of the kind of questions you need to look into when doing implementation work. So, we will not be doing, for instance, a complete write-up on uh, the diploma validation, diploma uh, translation use case. That would be a little bit um, complicated to handle within the context of this project. But at least we do want to set out the specific questions that you need to check and to look into on um, whether the lightest infrastructure makes sense for you and how you should implement it. And respect with the uh, GDPR, um, the regulation on data protection, um, is one of the key elements in there. Saying, well, okay, before you put personal data within the DNS uh, system, before you publish that, uh, check first that this is in compliance with data minimization obligations under the GDPR and make sure that there is a reason for publishing it if you do so. But to be honest, I haven't seen any use case yet where it is necessary, where it would be justifiable to publish personal data within the DNS, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means, so far at least, we can't come up with any. So that's all good, and we have a lot of other uh, national laws on, that uh, have been that have, don't, haven't been um, standardized at the European level where we know that the rules are going to be different from country to country, like the representation of companies. Um, types of companies are, have not been harmonized even at the European level, the types of mandates, the kind of titles that you can have within uh, a company, um, the kinds of contracts, the signature requirements that you have for that, liabilities, all of that is regulated at the national level, and this isn't stuff that we can just fix by saying, throw it on uh, the DNS and um, it is solved. So that all the framework that you have within legislation works very well at the national level. What we want is to go 
for uh, DNS as a global system. This is the kind of step-up approach that we have. I think if we were going to do this just for a European project or just from a national project, it wouldn't make much sense to work with DNS. What the objective that we have very specifically is coming up with a technology that can work um, globally. So um, the approach is very different. Obviously, DNS is not uh, governed by legislation. It's, it's a multi-stakeholder model that determines how domain name system works, expert consensus. It's about also making sure that information can technically be validated. It doesn't promise you that information is uh, accurate. To, be, to give a very pragmatic example of what we mean by that, uh, like I said, my company is Timelex. If you go to timelex.be, for instance, you do not have a guarantee that that information relates to us. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure that we own timelex.be anymore since we use the European domain name. Um, or to give a more, much more um, obvious example, um, and we all know that there's a lot of, has been a lot of litigation about um, domain names and uh, cyber squatting. If you go to ferrari.be, for instance, is a, a well-known example in the Belgian context, you would expect probably to see the Belgian website from Ferrari, the car company. You actually get to see the Belgian website from uh, a Belgian steel manufacturer from a family that is also called Ferrari. This is what you get when you name your company after your last name. Uh, people with the same last name can use the name as well. Ferrari, the steel company, got there first. So Ferrari, the car company, cannot have Ferrari.be. This is just to say that um, DNS works perfectly for technical validation, but doesn't have any assurances about the trustworthiness or legal value of the information. And that needs to come from elsewhere, and the elsewhere is part of what we are developing within uh, Linus. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so when you say technical validation, yes. you mean we know this is a particular website? Or <laughs> what, what, what exactly is being validated? The validation is essentially the chain of information. Just the simple fact that you know, OK, if I I can follow the hierarchical subdomains and make sure that all of the sub-information is under the control of um, the same, uh, the owner of the ultimate, the, um, the ultimate domain name. So anything that's published under timelex.eu is under the control of whoever owns timelex.eu. So representation.timelex.eu is controlled by whoever controls timelex.eu. Um, which could be you or could be could a, be a fraudster, a fish, or whatever, right? Exactly. Yeah. Could be fraudster as well. Just the fact that um, at least you can use um, the DNS system as a technical trust anchor to be able to follow that you. chain okay. around. That's essentially what we're, uh, what we're working with. So, so, hi, Trina. I realize I'm really late, but I've come at the exact time for <laughs> exactly my question. So there is some thinking around how you could possibly follow the trail so that you could then know that it's actually Ferrari, the manufacturer, or Georgetown University that was controlling that DNS, and then therefore, okay. Absolutely. Right. So we already spoke about it a little bit earlier. In a nutshell, so one of the examples is, for instance, we have business registers in all countries that publish information about a company. Um, in some cases, who the shareholders are, but at any rate, who is the manager who is allowed to represent them? What kind of company? What is their capital? Those sort of, sorts of things. Um, you could use, you could publish that kind of information uh, via the DMS system as well in relation to each specific company. Right now, it's in databases managed by each individual business register. You could publish this information via uh, the DNS system as well. That would make that information a lot more accessible and a lot more uh, uh, valuable and easier to validate. So that's one of the ways in which you could strengthen that. The objective that we have, to be clear, is not. Um, to improve the trustworthiness of DNS. To, it's not the objective to increase the likelihood uh, that my company is actually, the domain name of my company is actually owned by my company itself, because no. then we would get into, our objective to be very pragmatic about it is not to make sure that Ferrari.be is owned by Ferrari, the car company. That is not a problem that we can fix. The problem that we're trying to solve is we want to use DNS just as a generic tool for publishing trustworthy information. And uh, to give a very pragmatic example of that, um, the EIDAS trust list is a clear case where trusted information is already published by specific recognized public authorities. We say, well, rather than you all publishing that information via trust list aut autonomously, put it in um, a, a domain name which is under your control, which they already do because they are already published as, as XML files. And at the EU level, we have uh, a, for instance, a URL called trustedlist.europa.eu, I 
think actually that's the, the that's the URL they use for publishing publishing information about the trust list, but not the technical information, and have that contain pointers to the individual uh, URLs of uh, all of the member states. So, for instance, for Belgian trust list information, you could find that under Belgium.trustlist.europa.eu, rather than forcing people to have to go search for. Um, what the Belgian national authority is and where the information might be published. So that's a very um, simple example of how you can use DNS for publishing and uh, validating trustworthy information. So how are we addressing that? And this is, again, this is generic. This isn't specific for the pilots, but what are we trying to do generally? So DNS is just our technical trust. I hear that's an important message because we're not suggesting that everything that you find in the domain name system is by definition trustworthy. We know that that's not the case. We know that there are going to be cases uh, of fraud on that. But that's not uh, our perspective. The legal, the legal uh, value and the compliance of, our, of uh, the work that we have done and the work of uh, the public information that we get published doesn't come from the fact that uh, we're using the domain name system. There always needs to be a legal trust anchor uh, behind that, be it in the form of a legislation, a specific contract, a specific agreement. And that is use case specific. So there's, we're not going to say at the end of it, there's going to be a framework agreement uh, for lightest. And anybody, any organization can join, can accede to that, and then your information will be trustworthy. Our objective is also not to have a lightest regulation or a lightest law at the end that says this is the technology which you must or should use, um, and then your information is trustworthy. Our conviction is very much that this will depend on use case to use case. What we are going to be doing, obviously, we try to make Lightest as, com we try to have compliance built in as much as possible, meaning that we do follow the state of the art in terms of um, security. We also implement privacy by design principles in the sense that we want to provide um, specific guidelines on how you can use this technology, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. We're also going to be providing some templates that people can use who want to set up this infrastructure. So the example being, for instance, what if I'm an industry association and I want to use something like Lightest to publish information about my members, whatever it is. The example that I gave was I want to publish you know, the, the members that I have and what factories they are using to produce canned goods. That's the kind of thing that you could, uh, that you could use. What we then want to produce is to produce a template agreement that an industry association in a case like that can use to set up its interactions with um, specific companies. We can also provide terms and conditions and privacy policies for the end users of that information that allow you to put, if you want, some liability behind that. In many cases, an industry association probably won't even want to do that. They will say, well, this is a tool that I provide to you as my, uh, to my members. You can use this. You don't have to, but you know, here are the commitments that we have. On, here are the measures that we take for making sure that this information is accurate, that it's trustworthy. Here's what we do um, when we notice that it's no longer trustworthy. Here are your obligations if you're going to be publishing information like that. Here are your obligations for keeping it um, up to date and getting it set up like that. So this is the contractual use case. It won't work in all cases, obviously. Uh, to give the lightest, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the EIDIS example, we have the EIDIS regulation saying that information must be published through Trustlist using this uh, specific format, using this specific profile. Um, is Lightest going to be in line with that? No, obviously not. We're publishing the information in a different way. It'll be the exact same information. We are hoping to show that it will have the exact same reliability, that it will have a lot of benefits in terms uh, of usability and scope, but it's not in line with the IDIS regulation. If we want this kind of solution, um, our Lightest approach, to be used instead of Trustless, the IDIS regulation needs to change. We cannot do that, but what we can do and what we hope to do is to provide a demonstrator to show how we, DNS, the system that exists right now, can be leveraged as a generic tool for publishing and validating um, trustworthy information. Um, so you need to look more or less at a case-by-case -case basis on what kind of framework you need, whether legislation needs to be changed, or whether you can work on a contractual basis. Now with the pilots that we have, it's an interesting mix because they are um, the, both the communication service from Korea as the PEPL invoicing pilot. Those are cases where there is some legislation behind that. Um, legislation that also specifies what kind of data formats, what kind of technologies uh, you have to use. Um, we cannot change those, but what we can show is that the DNS system is a uh, functionally equivalent way of doing this. 
and importantly, that's not a part of this presentation, but the uh, main reason why we want to do this, this is because it allows you to go globally a lot more easily. <coughs> the IDIS regulation, essentially you can only build uh, international cooperation with countries that use the same structural approach, the same supervision of trust service providers, uh, same kind of accreditation, verification uh, approaches, and the same formats for publishing trusted lists. If you don't have that, it simply technically, functionally does not work. Whereas with the DNS approach, you can allow countries much more flexibility on how they want to publish their information, and you can allow um, private companies that want to use these solutions to be much more free in what they trust. To be very pragmatic about it, if I am um, Adobe, I have my trusted list. I am happy because the Europeans created a technology that basically I was using already, so it was easy for them to integrate uh, the European trust list. But expanding that to other countries is quite complicated. If, uh, because they have to, other countries that have to establish similar trust lists and you have to do the mappings whether they are equivalent or not. When you're using a DNS system, basically any country can decide that they want to publish information using the same technical format, and an individual company, an individual end user can determine for itself whether it wants to use the solution, whether it, that solution meets their requirements. That's still very abstract, so let me make this very concrete. If I were here one week from now, I would have a lawyer's card in my pocket. Uh, unfortunately, they started issuing them last month, but for some reason that I don't understand, I wasn't first in line to get one, I'm getting mine next week. So, lawyer's card, smart card. Um, this is an EIS compliant card in the sense that it has certificates for qualified signatures. So you know, we use a certification provider which is on the uh, trust list, the Belgian trust list. So that's fine, great, TSP. That won't help me very much, however, if I want to uh, exchange documents, ex exchange correspondence with lawyers outside of the EU because the concept of qualified signature will be meaningless to them. Now you can say, ah, but the good solution to that is uh, new legislation. If all of these countries would just change their laws to use the same kind of approach, then it would all work. <laughs> that would be nice. But it's also a little bit, it's not likely, and it's also kind of overkill. We do have, um, you know, international bar associations or the European bar associations. These people can also cooperate and say, look, we will build our own solution. All of our members can just publish information about signatures that they consider to be trustworthy within their DNS system, within uh, their own URLs that they already use publish information about what kind of trust providers that they consider to be uh, trustworthy, and we as international organizations will reference those so that lawyers' uh, signatures tools can be considered equivalent within that particular profession with for the functionalities of that profession. It won't ensure that, for instance, a signature from a Taiwanese lawyer's lawyer is compliant with the requirements of Belgian uh, e-signature legislation, but at least it will allow us as lawyers to exchange trustworthy information with a tool that's approved by our bar associations. That's the kinds of flexibilities that you get. If you want the legal recognition, you need the legislation to change. That's something that we cannot steer around. But something that we can steer around is the need for legislation to allow this kind of communication to take place. That we can use the NS. So First thing I'd say is that uh, DNS generally is meant to be a very lightweight infrastructure, and the amount of stuff you can jam into a CNAME record is actually meant to be quite limited. Mm -hmm. And I also look at what our name is, latest, which is also like really trying to limit how much burden is put on an organization to join. As I hear you talk, the complexity sounds like a lot more than what you're describing. Like I don't think I can jam this all in a CNAME record, so I'm not understanding how you how this is meant to work. I think the the core element is that um, the basic requirement is that your URL needs to point to specific trustworthy information, and that means that the information that you inject in DNS itself can be fairly minimal. The infrastructure and the logic behind that will remain complicated. That's not something that we can solve. Just the assessment, for instance, of which kind of signature technologies are, are trustworthy and which kind of requirements that they are meet. The actual trust policies behind that, those we cannot simplify. Those can, can and probably will remain relatively heavy. What we can do is facilitate the communication of saying, okay, well, this particular solution complies with this uh, trust policy, simply by having a pointer from a specific solution to a specific trust policy pointer. Right, so it's going to be a collection of URLs, right? You're basically saying you're going to publish a collection of URLs in DNS. That's what you're... Yes. So I'm going to have a long scene in, but I like all these URLs. This is a good list of the signature guys I will interoperate with. 
it, it is essentially implemented as a list of URLs. Um, the value from that comes, behind, comes uh, from the fact that you can build your infrastructure behind it and determine what the validity and what the usefulness of that information is. So I, I guess my, well, the domain registrars let you jam all those stuff in the DNS record is my question. You know, we'll, we'll have to find out as we go along with this project, but